Thank you very much. I'd um, like to extend the thanks to the Diggers Forum and particularly to Samantha and Kelly for their chance to talk to you today. Um, I'm showing my age here with a reference to Marty Pello, of course, with Wet, Wet, Wet. Um, uh, what I've currently work, I suppose, my current job title is I'm a chief executive, which all sounds very grand, uh, of a very small society, a very small charity and company based in Portsmouth. And we've been training people in nautical or maritime, and I'm going to use those two terms completely loosely, archaeology now for 30 years. It's 30 years exactly. In fact, we celebrated our 30-year birthday party in April in Bristol University, teaching a course to university students who we taught 30 years ago uh, and invited the tutors that taught that course 30 years ago to see how things have changed. And we all had a lovely cake. Um, uh, I've worked for the NES actually for 15 years, so I've been there quite a long time uh, nowadays, I suppose, in people's professional careers. They tend to often jump around and do lots of different things. 15 years, I started as a volunteer, in fact, in 97, 98. Uh, I then worked as an office, as office administrator uh, right at the very bottom, slowly but surely um, killed everyone else off, worked my way up to the top, uh, and now um, very recently became the chief executive of an organisation which I suspect many of you have not even heard of. So I'll hopefully give you a little bit of background. It's just my watch falling over to make sure I stay on top. Um, with my other hat on, I'm actually an NVQ assessor as well. Uh, I'm a free, I do that freelance in my spare time, what free time there is, and I'm uh, currently uh, assessing a placement student at Historic England in Fort Cumberland who's a training archaeobotanist. Now I take that as being my CPD because I know nothing about archaeobotany uh, and now know a little bit more and slowly but surely, hopefully with her assistance, I'll know more and more. So the training program that we run uh, began 30 years ago and actually piggybacked on the Mary Rose experience, you've probably all heard of the Mary Rose if not been to the museum in Portsmouth, where they used recreational divers to dig up what was at, certainly at the time probably the most important maritime find certainly for uh, Great Britain uh, that there had ever been and perhaps you might argue it will ever will be. Um, now they used recreational divers simply because there were no underwater archaeologists and in the pub in the evenings the guys that were training the recreational divers said, wouldn't it be great if there was a program that existed whereby the trainees could come on site and they, the, the divers already knew the basics, at least. They understood stratigraphy, they understood the importance of context. So the NES training program was formed as a result of that and it works on the ethos, which 30 years ago perhaps wasn't as common, which is that heritage protection via public education and participation is perhaps just as important as legislation in, for protection of cultural heritage. Um, now our, pro our program has evolved over 30 years and now is not just aimed at, at recreational scuba divers by any means, it now uh, has moved up, perhaps uh, a bit like uh, our ancestors if Darwin is right. We've moved from the underwater world and we've climbed up the beach, we now work on the foreshore and we now work on the coastline as well. Um, last year we relaunched our program from a training program to an education program uh, and our new syllabus we hope supports the National Occupational Standards or works alongside those standards uh, and helps candidates that are going through the NVQ to uh, build up their experience and their knowledge and understanding for their portfolios. Um, I'm going to briefly, hopefully, go through for you the background, the nitty-gritty to our training programme, what it involves, how it's delivered, how it's designed, and then it kind of I didn't really plan to do this, but whilst I was preparing the presentation a couple of days ago, uh, as, of, as is often the case, I suppose, um, I started looking at the skill sets that underwater or maritime archaeologists might need and have, and who has them, and, and at different stages of your career, are you expected to have them all? Um, so it's kind of diversified ever so slightly, perhaps, than from the abstract had suggested, uh, and I make apologies for that. So we are, the NES, are non-government, so we are a registered charity, we're also a limited company. We've been uh, incorporated at Companies House since the 1970s, uh, with our aims to further research in nautical or maritime heritage and archaeology, and to publish the results of that research. So we are a publishing organisation as well. Uh, we, through the training programme, or education programme, we advance education, training and techniques pertaining to those subjects. So we are quite niche. I suspect in the room, if we wanted to show our hands, there are probably none. Maybe one, I don't know, there was a, uh, Andy was in earlier on, he was, but he's walked down, he's left. Uh, anyway, uh, if we had a mission statement, that would be it. Uh, we're an enabling organisation, enabling involvement skills, knowledge acquisition, etc, uh, etc, et for um, maritime or underwater cultural heritage. Uh, and like the Diggers Forum, uh, the NES certainly believes in practitioners, those that call themselves professionals, being uh, uh, at least competent to the level of a, a practitioner within the Chartered Institute. 
We support all our staff. We pay for their membership uh, of the chartered institutes. Uh, and in fact, we're one of the very first organizations to get uh, an NVQ candidate through their NVQ level three, who then later worked for us, uh, Mary. So we, we, we're a bit of a polymath, really. We're a membership, we're publishing, education, lobbying, advisory, and a research body, uh, and recently also became an accredited uh, non-government organization to UNESCO for the United Nations Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. Not wishing to sound too much like a sales pitch. Uh, we've been doing this 30 years, as I say, um, from the, a long time ago, way before my time, and I certainly can't take credit for the initial ideas and the thoughts and the development. But we are award-winning. We were the organization that won the first ever Archaeology Training Forum Award in 2011. Uh, and it was quite a proud moment where Mary, who was our training manager at the time, who was the NVQ candidate who was on a placement, who then worked for us, went up and accepted the Archaeology Training Forum Award for us back then. Over 10,000 people have gone through our program all over the world because we franchised it out. Oh, Andy, you're here. We franchised it out. You just moved. Uh, to uh, overseas, and I'll go on to that in a second. It's been supported by English Heritage, as it was then, CADU, Historic Scotland, and UNESCO, not because they think it's fun to give courses for divers at all, but because as part of a heritage management strategy in this ethos that education is just as important, in many ways you might say more important, than legislation in protection. We like to think our training is for competence, and competency is the key here. We're trying to train people in skills that they can use on the foreshore and underwater, as well as it being about raising awareness to the general public about the threats to underwater or maritime cultural heritage. But we're not the only ones. Of course, I would be amiss of me not to mention there are others. You can, people can do courses with universities at Southampton, at Bournemouth, particularly at BA, oh sorry, at MA level. There are two trusts, two charities that involve volunteers, the general public, they train people, they even do some basic training courses. And then there are two commercial units, principally that do underwater archeology, span Wessex and Cotswold, uh, in uh, England and Scotland and Wales, who also do in-house training and use volunteers on their sites working with them in joint teams. But we are the only ones to be franchised overseas. We have uh, non-for-profit bodies, universities, federal bodies like NOAA uh, and National Park Service in the US teach our training courses. And we've also now just broken, last month, we've broken into the Far East with a training license agreement in Hong Kong and China. Uh, so we're looking forward to our training program being translated. How I know what it says, I've got no idea. Uh, this is what our current education program looks like. It's very complicated because uh, I've tried to squeeze it all onto one screen in one slide, but I'll break it down a little bit uh, at a time for you. Um, it's very broad based, it's very broad brush. We, we accept that people learn in lots of different ways and that you can learn on the job, you can learn from coming to a conference, from networking, you can learn from uh, attending a single day course or attending a lecture or a seminar, uh, or even you actually learn quite a lot by preparing the lesson the lecture you've got to give uh, and the homework that is required in doing that. So our vision, because this was only launched last year, uh, our vision is that most people will come to the program at the skills day. So this is a practical day on the foreshore or underwater on a real site where they get to basically take part in a non-intrusive way. So it's observation, it's illustration, photography and video of a site. The, very, the way that you would if you were assessing a site at the very beginning before thinking about undertaking any kind of intrusive work. Um, so we get divers and non-divers coming on those foreshore and underwater days and then they can then bolster that if they wish to, they can bolster that learning, that experience with an online course. So we have an e-learning platform that was funded through Histor uh, English Heritage as it was uh, uh, many years ago where people can do foreshore or underwater specialisms and learn through a screen, learn at their own time or on an iPad sitting on the sofa or on a train or wherever they happen to be. Our more advanced courses are completely standalone, so people can come on them as a, the very first introductory session, or they can do it as their CPD. If you've got to keep your CPD log up for your, uh, I, uh, your CIFA membership, then these are standalone one-day, single-day courses, not taught by us. These are taught by subject matter experts. And that's where one of the issues sometimes comes about, because getting those subject matter experts available at the time you want them, when you want them, in the location you want them, for a price that's reasonable, uh, because it's not funded in any way, there's no support for this, it has to be self-funding, uh, it's quite difficult sometimes, and it's from everything from shipwrightry, iconography, environmental impact assessments, dendrochronology, conservation report writing, basic finds, identification, etc. So a broad range, and it's from research to pre-field work to then in the field, and then post-field work. So we've broken down the archaeological process uh, into these four areas. And people can gain credits by doing the courses, and they gain credits five five credits a day per course, 
and then after 100 credits or 200 credits they can get certificates and awards uh, which are recognised by universities and other institutions and employers as being uh, worthy of you know, um, acceptance into university or for uh, bolstering their already academic qualifications. Now we also do, we accept, and I think in fact this is probably very true, that most people learn best about fieldwork in the field. So we, provide, we offer credits for doing field work and that, in an underwater context, it's quite different perhaps from land, that's often doing it by yourself or with your mates. It's not supervised. Supervising and having oversight in an underwater context is quite difficult. Uh, we can't be with lots of people all the time making sure and answering questions. It doesn't work that way. It's why underwater archaeology takes so long. Um, anyway, so we accept, we offer credits for if it's member run or they're doing it themselves. And then we offer more credits if they do have oversight and guidance and supervision through an organisation that we uh, accredit or whether it's through ourselves. Um, and then we also offer credits for attending events. So for example, conferences, seminars, lectures, heritage days around museums with curators. This conference is accredited as, so any of our NES members going through or people going through our programme who wanted to can gain credits for attending this conference. Five credits a day, so a three-day conference, 15 credits. Uh, I think I might pass that maths exam just for that. Uh, right. So, uh, we're working on the idea, as I said, that competence is key, and this goes back to the Archaeology Training Forum back in 2007, that we need a way of being demonstrating this competence if we're going to call ourselves archaeologists, uh, and demonstrating those skills. Uh, and this was, that was a long time ago, 2007. It doesn't seem like much, but when you think about it, that's, that's, you know, that's you know, a long time. Even earlier than that, actually, back in 2004, the IFA, as they were then, actually did a, a project, a funded project, called um, Identifying Skills Needs in Maritime Archaeology. It was recognised that maritime suffered from skill losses or low level of skills. Sometimes that's because the diver themselves can be not supervised. They're in the water. They can get away with murder. You can get away with pretty much destroying your site, because who's going to know? Because uh, nobody can come over your shoulder and have a look at you at the time. So low levels of competency were considered at the time in 2004, uh, and these were the recommendations. Now these aren't groundbreaking conclusions, to be honest, uh, and after 2004, what, 12 years on, I'm not really sure we're that much further on down the line in terms of demonstrating that we have really linked these skills to the occupational standards for underwater, certainly, uh, and we certainly haven't perhaps addressed insufficient training requirements. In 2009, we did a study commissioned again by English Heritage called Benchmarking Competency in Maritime Archaeology, and it came up with seven recommendations. I'm only going to look at two because of brevity of time. One is this occupational standards issue, uh, particularly in maritime and nautical archaeology, and then this creation of the competency scheme. Now, the, the skills passport's been mentioned already a couple of times uh, today, and I'm going to mention it again a little bit in terms of the validity I think it has. So the occupational standards element to this, well... I personally believe, from talking to colleagues, talking to people going through our training program, both professionally and uh, avocationally, that the occupational standards are still quite little used and little understood, and it's a challenge for the people within the uh, institute and within the ATF to make sure that, um, that they become more used and they, become, they proliferate themselves into archaeology and into training. I still suspect that very few institutions, universities, uh, or um, other training providers really measure their training against the occupational standards units to demonstrate that they're fit for purpose for people, for people like yourselves that need or want to do more learning and gain, gain new skills in different areas. Um, now it was believed, of course, that the occupational standards would help benchmark training to make sure that everybody, all the training courses that were being offered or were being supported or funded, uh, would help new entrants with their competence development and their career progression. Whether it does or not still, I think is a little bit up for debate and more work to be done. That's by no means a criticism at all. The other part of it were for us was this creation of this competency scheme, and we have logbooks. Uh, a competency scheme for me is nothing new. As a commercial professional diver, I have to keep a log of every single paid dive I do, which is not just a safety thing. It's not just about what depth you go to, what times you go to, and what illnesses you might suffer as a result. But it's all to do with what you're doing, the tasks you're doing, the observations you're making. Uh, to demonstrate to the next contractor that you work for that you have experience of doing this because if they give you a job to do, you're putting your life on the line and you could quite easily, yeah, I can do that, no problem. But they can use your logbook, which has been signed and stamped by your contractor, to prove that you can or you have done it before in the past. So as a diver, this, this idea of keeping a portfolio and keeping a record or a log of what you do as an archaeologist 
is not new to us, but to, I think to, to land archaeologists, I think at the time, uh, it certainly was uh, quite a new idea. It's supposed to be inexpensive. It's supposed to be a, a cheap way of keeping a record and demonstrating that record to your next employer. And I have to congratulate David uh, Connolly at Badger and, and Archaeology Skills Passport for what he's done in driving this forwards. It's never come off the agenda. And I went to an IFA thing years ago in York where it was quite new. Uh, and I thought, well, you're going to struggle to get this. Uh, but he's kept it going and he's kept it going. Um, and in fact, when you look at what they've identified, uh, the core skills, the secondary skills, the tertiary skills that are required, for just out of interest, really, I'm assuming most of you had heard of this before today. Yeah. Does anyone actually use one, have one, keep one? Because that's David's next battle. His next battle is to get it into, uh, into the subject. When we did our benchmarking study, we identified, this was 2009, so it's quite a while ago, we identified technical skills, academic skills, archaeological skills, professional skills, and employee skills. And then if, for those working in underwater, we had to add to that diving skills. Because it's all well and good having everything else, but if you can't actually dive or you're no good in the water, and for us that means working often in 20 centimetre visibility, doing a lot of it by feel and touch, uh, then it's useless. So for technical skills, we'd call that boat recording, photography, photogrammetry, geophysics, blah, you can read it, blah, blah, blah. Archaeological would be understanding sequences, relationships, association, chronology, source identification. Academic skills, professional skills, such as applying ethics, understanding, responding to context, wider context of the work that you're undertaking. And employee skills, such as time management, team working, communications, leaderships, taking responsibilities. Now... When you start, when people start an archaeological career, they may have different levels of those skills already. And in fact, you could argue that archaeology is quite good because you can come at archaeology from all sorts of different routes because you have other skills that you have gained in your, in your other employment. Um, but I would argue that for most people beginning their archaeology career, and even in 2016, I suspect that most of you come from a degree route into archaeology. I'm not going to get a show of hands, but I suspect most people do uh, that are here at the conference. When you start... This is probably where you're at. Professional skills, to be honest, probably none. Employee skills, probably very little, because if you haven't had your first archaeology job yet. Uh, archaeological skills, you probably like to think you've got quite a lot. You probably like to think technical skills and academic skills. Well, you've probably had to do a thesis. You've had to write a, a, a dissertation. Um, so in terms of academic skills and writing skills, you're probably there. We certainly find with diving skills that most graduates just don't have it. They can't do it. They, they have a qualification that's not suitable. They can't get paid to dive because they haven't done their commercial qualification. Now, as you go forward in your career, a few years on, 10 years on, maybe into your career, you're hopefully going to become a more rounded individual. And I don't mean putting weight on in middle age. Uh, but what I mean is, is that your skill sets will become more rounded. You will become actually uh, better at all of all things. Your knowledge base will grow. Your expertise will grow uh, in all of those areas. But what I've found now as <coughs> over 40 is that as you start to go on in your career, it changes again. It evolves. I now don't no, no longer certainly consider myself to be technically as skilled as I was five years ago in the field. I now only dive 20, 25 days a year, probably, compared to previously where I may have been doing up to 50 or 100 uh, days diving in the year. Um, this side photogrammetry, you probably see nowadays an awful lot. I have no idea how you do that. I'd love to know how you do that, and it's on my hit list. But I don't know how to do it. So technically, my skills as technology as advances there's different ways of I've got no idea how you laser scan an, an, art, an artifact, an object. I probably couldn't even set up a total station or a dump level anymore. I have no idea because my job has changed. My role has changed. My responsibilities have changed. What I need to know has changed. My brain cannot cope with everything. I have to ditch some things, take on other things, take on other knowledge, take on other skills, and hope that it's a bit like riding a bicycle. I'll pick it up. I'll pick up the manual, I'll read a little bit, I'll take some guidance, and then maybe, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to pick up those skills again. So to finish, my final slide with two minutes to go. So to finish with then, this bit is where I really didn't expect to be doing any of this, and it kind of came out during the course of writing this, but I've certainly come to the conclusion that your areas of expertise, and your expertise, of course, is made up of your knowledge and your skills and your experience. That area of expertise will change as your career grows and as your career develops. Some things will get bigger, some things will grow, some things will shrink, some will become priorities to your job at the time that you're doing it and others you just really don't need anymore but what you know and what you need to know uh, or I suppose the important thing is I suppose is knowing what you need to know at the time in your career so making it somebody hopefully a line manager supervisor guidance mentor whatever making it clear to you what you need to know and the important bit of course is to strive for the better 
is to strive to be good at the things you want to be good at. Whether that's by yourself, learning on the job as you go and trying and finding out what you can from watching videos on YouTube, or whether it's from attending formal courses. But don't expect to be good at everything. I don't think you can be. You're not a superhero, despite the Superman logo on your top. Uh, I'm not really sure. We're not superheroes. You can't really be good at, at everything. So knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're competent at, and knowing what you're not competent at is really crucial. Accept what you don't know and move, try, and find those learning opportunities to become better at it. Seek them out when they arise so that you can become better. Because only by you becoming better will the discipline become better, will the institute become better, will the, will the subject become better, um, will we become a better profession. Now I suspect I might be preaching to the converted because you're at this conference in this room, but hopefully the video, wherever it ends up going, uh, being on YouTube, means that lots of other people that perhaps didn't consider this a priority or couldn't get to it, couldn't get support to it, couldn't get time off work to come to it, will also be able to, to strive to become better so that the profession can become better. I will end there. Thank you.